Welcome to this next video in the playlist on ring theory. In this video what we're going to discuss is the concept of a ring homomorphism and the concept of an ideal. Okay, now before we actually begin with the concept of a ring homomorphism, I firstly want to talk about the concept of a ring isomorphism, which is a slightly more intuitive concept than a homomorphism. Now if you've studied other parts of abstract algebra, so group theory, linear algebra, uh, field theory, whichever other portion of abstract algebra, um, the concept of a ring isomorphism is exactly the same as it was in group theory or vector spaces or field theory. Okay, it is an algebraic equivalence. If two rings, so let's say we have two rings, so let's say we have one ring R, which for a picture I will draw like so. So here is the box which represents the set of symbols in R. So I have this in orange here. And let's say we've got another ring which we'll call R prime here. And let's say to draw a picture that this box here represents the set of symbols of R prime here. If these two rings are isomorphic to one another, it means that the algebraic structure is identical between the two. In fact, the only difference between these two rings is going to be that you have used different symbols uh, in the two different rings. Okay, so the elements in the rings uh, will have different symbols, but that's the only difference if two rings are isomorphic to one another. Okay, so the two rings are identical to one another, but for the fact that you've used different symbols. Now, do we care about which symbols you've used? Well, of course, the answer is usually no. We don't care about the symbols that uh, we use. Those symbols are chosen by humans. They're not part of the interesting algebraic structure there, something that some human has chosen. Okay, so they're not actually that important. Okay, so let's make this precise then. So what um, if if two rings are isomorphic to one another, then there should be a way of relabeling up the elements in one ring with the elements in the other ring and turning this one into this one. Okay, so let's just extend this picture a little bit more. So both of these rings will have addition and multiplication laws defined on them. So here is the addition law for our ring R here our first ring, and here is the multiplication law for our first ring. And I'll just colour these in, so I'll colour the addition composition table for our orange ring in orange and the multiplication table likewise. And now our prime, our second ring here, this will also have two composition tables defined on it. So here is the addition composition table, and here is the multiplication composition table. And once again I'll colour those in, and we'll colour them in green since everything to do with our prime is being coloured in green here. Okay, now, if these two are isomorphic, so they're the same ring but for the fact that you've used different symbols in uh, the second one to what you've used in the first one, then the idea is that there should exist a mapping, a relabeling mapping called an isomorphism, which we'll call phi, which is going to take all the elements in our first ring, so here let's say is an element of the ring A, and it will map it onto some element in the second ring which we'll call phi of A. So it will map all of the elements of our first ring into or onto elements of the second ring, and we will want this to be a bijective map because we want it to be a relabeling map. So uh, we want it to be both injective and subjective. Injective means that we're not going to have multiple elements in the domain here being mapped onto the same element in the codomain. Of course, we don't want to be relabeling up multiple different elements here with the same element over here. That's rubbish. Okay, um, that would not be an isomorphism. In addition, we want it to be subjective because we want every element in our codomain ring here to actually have an element in the domain ring that was uh, relabeled to become it. Okay, so we will want this mapping to be a bijective map so that it truly does represent this relabeling of the elements in this first ring with elements in the second ring. Okay, now, but we're going to want it to be more than just that because what we want to achieve is that if we use this map, this bijective relabeling map, to relabel up the addition and multiplication tables here, we want to turn them into the addition and multiplication tables here. Okay, so I'm saying we can change all the symbols in this first ring, we can relabel them up, we can say, right, I don't want to call this A anymore, I want to call it phi of A instead. So we go through and rub out all of our old symbols and replace them with new symbols from 
on here. Okay, and I want that to be a brilliant relabeling such that it's a bijective relabeling. Okay, so subjective and injective. Uh, and now what I'm saying is I want to now go and do this relabeling to my addition and multiplication tables here. Okay, so I want to go through and rub out the old symbols and replace them with my new symbols, my new chosen symbols from my codomain ring here. And I want to be able to turn this addition and this multiplication table into the addition and multiplication tables over there. If I can do that, then truly, I hope you realize that those two rings were identical because just by changing the symbols that I'm using here, I can turn this one into this one. So formally, this concept of two rings being isomorphic, being the same up to the fact that they've got different symbols for each of the elements, uh, can be captured with this concept of isomorphism. Okay, now, what we want to do is capture this concept that the addition table here will be turned into this addition table here by the isomorphism, and the multiplication table likewise. But we want to do it in a very nice, succinct, formulaic way. Okay, and there is such a way of doing it. Okay, so let me show you how to do this. So if we have two elements in our original ring, okay, so in our original ring R here, okay, and let's say they're both going to be relabeled up by my isomorphism, so A will be relabeled labeled up as phi of A, and B will be relabeled up as phi of B. Now, in my addition table here, I can look at what is A plus B. Okay, that's absolutely fine. These are just two elements of my ring, so A plus B will be defined, and it will be some other element of the ring here. Okay, now, when I perform this relabeling, what I'll come along and do is rub out A and replace it with phi of A here. So if you want, you can actually imagine rubbing this out and replacing it with phi of A. Uh, we will rub out B and replace it with phi of B. Okay, and then we will rub out A plus B, and what will we replace it with? We will replace it with phi of A plus B. However, if I want it to be the case that this is truly going to become this one here, then I better hope that phi of A plus B is a very particular element, because look, phi of A and phi of B are over here, and they have already got what phi of A plus phi of B is defined in this addition table. Okay, so in the addition table on the code main ring, there is an answer to what phi of A plus phi of B is equal to. And you better hope that if you're going to relabel this addition table up here and it become this, you better hope that phi of A plus B is equal to phi of A plus phi of B, the answer to what these two uh, elements added together in the codomain ring is equal to. Okay, so what we're actually going to ask for is that phi of A plus B is equal to phi of A plus phi of B like so, and we will need that to be true for absolutely every single entry here, so we'll need it to be, to be true no matter what A and no matter what B you pick from the domain ring, and if you let A and B vary over all the elements of the ring, then you can get, I hope you appreciate, every possible combination of two elements from the ring, i.e. you can get every possible entry in this addition composition table for our domain ring here. Okay, so this is our formulaic way of capturing this concept that when you use this bijective relabeling map, this ring isomorphism, to relabel up all of the elements of the domain ring with the codomain ring, that the addition composition table actually becomes the addition composition table on the codomain ring. Okay, so that's what that is saying, that relabeling up the addition table on the first ring gives you the addition table on the second ring. It's just a very nice way of actually writing it. Now, we can do the exact same thing for multiplication, so if you haven't fully understood that, we're now going to do the exact same thing for multiplication, so hopefully it'll get in there. Okay, so, again, we have these two arbitrary elements from our ring, and we can consider what is A multiplied by B in our multiplication table here. Now, when we come along and relabel up this multiplication table, we want it to become the multiplication table over here. Now, when we relabel up A, it will go to phi of A. So again, imagine rubbing this out and replacing it with phi of A. B will become phi of B. Okay, so we'll rub this out and replace it with phi of B. And A times B will be mapped onto something which we'll call phi of A times B. Now remember, A times B is just some element back within this ring here. Same with A plus B. Okay, so if I wanted, I could just put A plus B here and A times B. And then you're just acting this function on those two elements of the ring and getting what they're mapped onto in here. So that's all that phi of A times B there actually means. 
Now, if we want it to be the case that when you relabel this up, it becomes this, then we better hope that phi of a times b is a very particular element, because this multiplication table is already defined, and it says that phi of a times phi of b is this, phi of a times phi of b, whatever this is in the uh, codomain ring. So we're going to have to hope that phi of a times b, the thing we re relabel a times b up as, is equal to phi of a times phi of b, and again this will need to apply for absolutely every single entry in these composition tables, so it will have to apply for all a and b that you can possibly pick from the ring, so that we can get every possible combination of two elements of the ring being multiplied together here. And that's the second criterion that we need in order for this ring, uh, sorry, in order for this mapping to be a ring isomorphism. Okay, so fundamentally then, the first criterion we wanted was that it would be a bijective map. Okay, and that's very important. So it had to be bijective. Second criterion was this, that addition um, was truly isomorphic in this way. And the third criterion was that multiplication was truly isomorphic. The multiplication table on the domain ring is turned into the multiplication table on the codomain ring. Okay, so those are the three criteria that we want a ring isomorphism to obey. Now, uh, before we uh, move on to the concept of a ring homomorphism, I want to just stress something that's very important here. Okay, and I want to what I want to do is look at where do two very particular elements of the ring get sent. Okay, so two special elements of our ring, capital R here, are the additive identity 0 and the multiplicative identity 1. These are very special elements of the ring. So what I want to consider is where does the additive identity get sent by this isomorphism phi? Okay, and I claim that it always gets sent to the additive identity in my uh, codomain ring here. Okay, so I claim this always goes to zero. Okay, so note this has the potential to be very confusing. This is zero in the codomain ring, and this is zero in the domain ring here. Okay, right, so how can I show that? Uh, well, I can go to this criterion here. So I know that for whatever a and b you pick in the ring, that this isomorphism, if it's to be an isomorphism, it must obey this uh, property here. So quite simply, let b equal the additive identity. Okay, uh, then what we'll have is that phi of a plus the additive identity in my domain ring is going to equal phi of a plus phi of zero. Okay, uh, so I will stress again that this is zero in the domain ring here. Okay, so this is true no matter what a and b you pick from the ring, so yes, it can, it can be the case that b is equal to the additive identity, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Okay, and I've left a completely general, I haven't specified which element of the ring a is, it can be whatever you like. Okay, but look at this side here. Okay, we can do something with this. A plus the additive identity. Well, by definition, any element of the ring plus the additive identity is just that element back again. So this truly is just phi of A. So we now have that phi of A is equal to phi of A plus phi of zero. Well, now this is a ring. Okay, so additive ident sorry, additive inverses exist in this ring, R prime. So let's now just add on to both sides the additive inverse of phi of A. And on this left-hand side, I hope you will agree, we'll get the zero element in my codomain ring here, so zero with a green line underneath it, and on the right-hand side here, the phi of a will cancel, and I'll just be left with phi of zero, okay, where this is zero in the domain ring, okay, so it's very easy to do that. Now, a could be whatever you like in this proof, uh, but you could incidentally make it some specific element of the ring to prove it, it's, it doesn't matter. Okay, we have now succeeded in proving that then, that the additive identity in the ring, in the domain ring, will always be carried to the additive identity in the codomain ring. Okay, and that should be fairly intuitive, uh, because remember these isomorphisms, they are effectively saying that the two rings are utterly identical to each other algebraically, so of course we're going to have to map the additive identity, this very special element uh, of the ring algebraically, onto the same equivalent element in the codomain main ring.
Okay, next, um, next thing that I want to say, which again is very intuitive just from what I've said about isomorphisms, is that phi of the multiplicative identity is also going to be the multiplicative identity. And you might think, well, why is he stressing this? It's because there is going to be a further criterion that we're going to have to add on in ring homomorphisms. Firstly, when we do generalize to ring homomorphisms, we'll get rid of the need for bijective. But you can't just keep these two. And if we don't go through this discussion now, you might get confused as to why we need to add the final one. Okay, but we will add another criterion onto this uh, when we discuss ring homomorphisms. Okay, we'll come back to that uh, later on, but that's why, why we need to stress this now, because we are going to uh, need it when we go on to ring homomorphisms. Okay, so the multiplicative identity uh, in the domain ring, so I'll underline that in orange there, is going to be mapped onto the multiplicative identity in the codomain ring then. So phi of 1 is equal to 1. How am I going to prove that? Okay, well this is actually more difficult to prove uh, than uh, this one, okay, because we can't just do the equivalent argument. We can, well, we can try, but we'll get to the problem of the not being multiplicative inverses for elements in the ring, okay, and that's where this will fail. However, we can still prove this, and we'll need the fact that this is bijective, and that's why when we uh, lose um, bijective, when we go over to ring homomorphisms, this actually doesn't become uh, certain. Okay.